first, introduction. So, um, uh, who am I? I'm Guillem. I work in the Power VR division in Imagination Technologies. I'm from the developer technology team. So, we are the guys that lead with the developer tools and developers. Um, I personally still do some work on the drivers, uh, especially when it comes to performance uh, analysis and all this stuff. So, I'm still a <laughs> really low level developer. I almost never programmed in Java in my life. I've recently discovered that Java had no structs. So, and I was actually surprised by that very negatively. So marketing tells me to put this slide here so you all know whose imagination technology is. Uh, we just do a lot of stuff when it regards to intellectual property that then hardware vendors license and chug into their mobile phones. Uh, I'm here for Power VR, which is probably our most famous product. And <laughs> how many of you have heard of Power VR before? How many of you have heard of Power VR or MIPS? Okay, because we recently bought MIPS as well, so we 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 now license even more hardware. Uh, we have a radio division as well, so we have kind of a consumer electronic. But anyway, yeah, uh, let's get cracking. Uh, First, I'll start with a crash course on graphics architectures. Um, let's start with a quick question. How many of you know which GPU your mobile phone has? How many of you know at least a single implication of that GPU architecture or that GPU vendor? OK. Well, hopefully, by the end of this talk, you all will raise your hand. <laughs> so let's get into pipelines. Pipelines are cool. So. Let's start by immediate mode render. That's the, the best way to start because this is how desktop works. And um, this maps almost one to one to an OpenGL ES pipeline. So vertex processing, clip, project call, rasterize. There is an early visibility test. It's not always in there, especially in the most ancient graphic cards. But nowadays we can assume it's there. Um, there's the texture and shading. Well, the, well, you can read the rest of the pipeline. What I would like you to see here is how this just gets triangle by triangle and keeps going through all the steps and writing back and forth the system memory. And for now on, we can call this Tegra, which is uh, Tegra 4 will be the same, Tegra 3 was the same, Tegra 2 was the same, and Tegra 1, let's forget about it. Um, Let's introduce now a concept which is very famous in the mobile space. It's tiling. Um, it's basically applying a divide and conquer algorithm to mobile graphics. Um, some high end desktop graphics cars start to use tiling and do an, a hybrid between tiling and immediate mode renderer, but on mobile phone, it's almost for sure that your GPU will tile. So, Ardeno tiles, Mali tiles, obviously Power VR tiles. <laughs> so, um, as you can see on this nice picture, it's basically divide the screen and process the fragments tile by tile on chip. We'll see now on the pipeline. This is more complex, but it's kind of the same at the beginning. So we got the whole scene, we split it into tiles, and then the second part of the screen, so after the, the, the orange primitive list and vertex data, which is called parameter buffer. I'll introduce him later. Um, the rest is run on a per tile basis. So by doing that, we utilize a lot the on-chip memory. And then we save a lot of um, memory system access, which, as you know, in mobile phones nowadays is shared. So you don't want to hammer the system memory, basically. Um, this guy can be uh, known as Mali or Ardeno. Uh, well, Ardeno is a bit of a hybrid as well, but we can call him Ardeno as well. Um, so that's, it, is it clear the first three steps are done with the whole scene and the rest are done per tile? There is an extra step here, which is the tiling. So there is an overhead on tiling, which is the tiling step. <laughs> is when we store all the tile data into a buffer that then later on will be used in order to fully optimize and be able to actually perform the fragment shaders on, on tile, on chip. So let's move. Now let's introduce a new concept, which is the fair rendering. 
this is kind of a bit of a lie. So this is what marketing marketing says that we are the fair renders and we are the only ones. That's definitely not true. I mean, but they couldn't find a better name for it. So. The real deferred rendering means that you send the OpenGL comments and they get executed when the hardware thinks that it's best to execute them. Uh, but th that's done by all the architectures in order to optimize. Maybe Terra doesn't do that or doesn't do it that often, but uh, Malier then on PowerVR certainly are deferred renders. So you do a GL draw and nothing will be drawn. Not a single, the hardware will not even move a single finger until you do an EGL swap buffers or flash the render target or do an EGL read pixels. So everything gets piped. Um, but well, we call the field rendering to an extra step that PowerVR hardware has, which is what makes us unique, which is this HSR. So we kind of in a smart way um, works a bit of a ray tracing, cannot give details because the AP is secret. So we basically just remove all the pixels that you cannot see and we don't do any kind of processing for that pixels. This means that you can send the, c the geometry in the order that you wish, that, that we don't care for that. That's the big advantage of our architecture, but please don't do that, because <laughs> otherwise your application will suck on other devices and you don't want that. So, But well, you could do it, and I mean, sometimes it's, I mean, you can speak with guys from Unity or Epic or whatever game engine you want to use. It's not trivial to simply sort all the objects so it's friendly with all the architectures. I mean, you have to deal that it will always not happen. And in this case, we will take a lot of advantage from it. Again, submit the, object, the objects in order, <laughs> please. So this is our pipeline. Um, you can consider this pipeline the same as a tile based with that extra step that is that HSR. This HSR, what basically does is know ahead of time which fragments are visible and thus should be processed. So we can prefetch the texture data ahead of time, or we can just simply not use it. So there is even less system memory used. It's basically this one and two, so it's kind of where the magic happens. Um, basically, you can think on this as a more efficient way of processing the fragments, because we simply don't process the fragments that are redundant. Um, as you will see on this talk, by the way, all the optimizations that I speak for Tylers, will work on the three Tyler architectures the same, so should be fine. Okay, now <laughs> we know the three big architectures, which are immediate mode renderer, tile-based deferred rendering, and tile-based rendering. So let's get this a quick hardware overview, don't get scared of that, uh, about how PowerVR works on the inside. This is just a quick summary. So the application submits the render, the driver submits the geometry, our driver here is like doesn't do anything. So if you get the timing st stats from our driver, it's nothing. It's just getting what the application, OpenGL is two or one application sent or three sends, and just puts it on a nice way so the hardware can read the system memory and start working with it. But the driver doesn't do anything. So if you put the timestamp on the beginning of the GL draw call and on the end, you would see the fastest GL draw calls in the world because the driver doesn't really do anything. Um, when we see the ALU step, that's um, our universal scalable shading engine, which processes everything you throw at it, um, so do all the other tilers. <laughs> that's the difference. For example, NVIDIA has dedicated non-unified uh, ALUs, which I will introduce you in a second. And after the clip project cool tile, well, after, after the clip project cool is done, we do the tiling step, which basically puts the data into the parameter buffer. It sorts the data starting by the position, well, how the driver guys want it optimized. So the hardware guys tells us to sort the data in a way, and we definitely do that during the tiling step. Uh, parameter buffer is, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's normally all right for developers. You shouldn't care for it unless you develop high-end games. How many of you develop high-end games? Okay, and navigation apps. How many of you develop navigation apps? Okay, so that's that's more dangerous here because navigation apps normally have plenty of vertices. So the tiling step is huge and have a huge parameter buffer. One of the problems of a parameter buffer is that it cannot grow infinitely big because it would destroy all the run the system have. Just fill it and that's it. 
So we have to kick a partial render when the parameter buffer is full. Never happens, and if it happens, panic. But if it happens, don't worry, I would know because you would send a drive, an, an email to the imagination like, hey, this is a chaos. Mm -hmm. So don't worry, it never happens, and if it happens, normally you email us and we help you. <laughs> it's not happening, so it should be fine. With the latest drivers, by the way, you can set the size of the parameter buffer, so it should be more under control, but just assume it doesn't happen. So, once we got all the tiles prepared and all the data, it's already waiting for us, we just need to do the tile. So this step, which is the fragment processing, is done per tile. So basically, the, the blending, coloring, and everything. Done per tile kind of gets translated one-to-one -one as done on chip. That gets translated one-to-one -one as done fast. So this is where all the advantage of our processor is. The way that we prefetch the textures uh, the way that we just get the data of the fragments that we can see and the way that we just process in general the fragments that we can see, that's a lot of an advantage. Uh, that has as well some smallish problems that, you know, the, the rendering APIs, I probably not thought with this architecture in mind, but that's fine. Another problem is that it's difficult to get some stats from it. For example, with Tegra you can know how milliseconds does a draw call take or how you know how much how long does it take to render a triangle there's no way you can know it here so the information is more difficult to to get so well we we obviously have some logic abstractions to it and we have perfect tools that will help you getting that information but it is not that easy to get so let's look at the advantages that we have um the first one that comes into mind is bandwidth saving, and that's what our customers are more happy about. So if you go to like Amazon, you look at the Amazon Kindle Fire web page, you would see it all, it's super bandwidth efficient. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> so, well, this is maybe a bit of an exaggeration with the width of the arrows <laughs> on the poor immediate mode renderer, but still the, the idea kind of remind, reminds the same. We save bandwidth. So. That's a problem for other vendors, but not for us. This has as well other implications that we'll see in the next three, four slides. So unified architecture, and that's, that's a nice one. We don't have separate vertex and fragment processors. Everything is processed on the USSC, which is our universal shader, whatever, scalable engine, USSC from now on. So Tegra does have uh, dedicated shader processing modules which leads to some nice things that if you want to optimize a game for Tegra, they tell you, oh, put Vertex, put Vertex data, just put more polygons, it's free, it's for free. Well, because in their hardware, the Vertex processor is idle like 70% of the time. <laughs> so they tell you to put more triangles and then problem happens on all the other architectures that that's not true. But that's how you get a Tegra optimized game. So. Uh, unifying the, the shader processing as well lets you like, sorry. Uh, well, no, no, no. It's uh, you can have vertex processing modules or fragment processing modules, and uh, if you read, for example, the Tegra Four white paper they actually defend why they have this. And I mean, they can convince you or not. I won't say my opinion on here, but... That, no, but that, seriously, that's a nice thing, because you have then more processors, and you can claim that you have a 72-core architecture, which, I mean... If we did that, we would have a 128-core architecture up to 256, so would are then on Mali, but our marketing goes in another direction anyway. <laughs> so, um, let's move on a bit. Um, Anti-aliasing, uh, something that it's famous on the Tylers is that the anti-aliasing is for free. High-end game developers and navigation developers, that's a lie, it's not free. It just has some costs, uh, but very small. You would never know, you would never notice. On, a, you know, on the highest end game you can imagine would be a 15%. So for the rest of developers we say anti-aliasing on a tiling, 
on a Tyler, like a Mali or a Power VR, especially on a Power VR, that's why I'm here to tell you about, it's free. And on the Series 6, it would be even more free because it would be even better, which is 8x MSAA. Series 5 and 5XT has 4x MSAA, and it's done on chip. So you can just use that extension, which is rendered to multi-sample texture, and that gives you MSAA for free. So please use it. it I mean, it's free. Uh, as mentioned here, we actually optimized uh, Skia quite a bit by using this extension because they were doing it by software, like blending plenty of triangles around the primitive edges, which, I mean, was how it's done on desktop, but not on mobile. Again, done on chip, almost free. That's um, something that I want. Ah, no, it's the next slide. So, microkernel. That's a fancy name, but. It's basically a very, very, very small operating system firmware, let's call it, that runs on the chip. Why do we do that? Because otherwise the interruptions would kill the kernel. There are so many interruptions in the GPU that if we had to listen to all of them, we would be more time processing interruptions that we wouldn't care about than processing graphics. So Series 5, marketing would kill me. This was a, git, a bit of a hack, so we kind of have the operating system running on the USSC cores. Series 6 has its own core, which is much cooler that way. Um, this has some implications, and is that, for example, we cannot communicate with the GPU at all. So there is no communication between driver and GPU. Everything goes to memory, and the GPU reads from that memory and puts data to memory again. But there is no direct communication CPU, GPU. Just a small interruption, interruption to be sure that it's not dead. Multicore, that's a, f that's a fun one. We actually claim that we have multi-cores, but that's a real core. That's what you assume it's a core. We have, uh, on the street, you would see up to four cores. Something nice of our cores is that it escalates really well. Uh, I think we never set an official number, but I don't know if it's, I th well, it's 95%. I don't know if we never said it, but we always say linear, but 95%. So there is a very small overhead. But almost nothing. And so the way this works is that you can see that if we are actually tiling, who cares the, which processor processes the tile, so we can just send the tile to different processors. So that's really smooth to do it. I mean, it's really natural. A funny thing is that some other architectures, <coughs> Mali, mm, have the, the cores and the tile position fixed. So if you have, you, know, you have a game that you're looking on a spaceship through a window and there is a huge space battle going in that window, that tile may be just fitting like one core. So this core would be like super stressed and uh, while the other will be sitting idle and that you would find a weird bottleneck. But that doesn't happen. I mean, let's be clear, it never happens. But anyway, I guess that we have, a, since we allocate dynamically the workload, happens less often. <laughs> Alpha blending, well, I, I should have put an image here of an alpha blending, but well, alpha blending is, you know what alpha blending is, don't you? It's just when you have some transparency on objects and you just put one in front of the other and blend them. Again, it's done on chip, so it's quite fast. And for example, we, since all our chip is, everything is done on chip and everything is unified, everything is done on 32-bit precision, which for example, in Tegra it isn't. In Tegra it's 16-bit. Uh, we, we call this a fancy name. I think it's inter internal true color, but I mean, it doesn't really matter. We basically do all the blending and then the dithering so we don't lose precision. Uh, what, why Tegra does it with 16-bit? Because, well, they have to write to system memory. All that blending is done on system memory. So if you have to blend 16-bit, 16, 16 that's all right. If you have to blend with 32-bit, that's twice as much memory. And Maybe they are true on that. We don't need that much precision in mobile phone, but sometimes we actually do, and sometimes it's noticeable, even though that now the mobile phones are getting that close to the consoles and stuff. So again, there is a small reminder here. The best way to sort the objects for your GPU in all the architecture is first the OPAC, then the alpha test. Please never use alpha test. Friends don't let friends use alpha test. And then alpha blend. I'll go back on alpha test later. And well, later is almost now. So 
you are clear now with the GPU's architectures, Tyler, mobile space, immediate mode render, desktop. Immediate mode render is really good when you have dedicated memory on your GPU, like in desktop, that you have an ATI car with like two gigs of GDDR5, so <laughs> you can really do whatever you want there. As soon as you are sharing memory, you want Tyler because everything is done on chip, so the memory doesn't get bashed that much. To be a bit more fair with immediate mode renders, that is, they have cache as well. If you read the, some white papers from some green company, they would tell you that the cache is up to 80% of the red brights. I guess that if you have some corner cases, that'd be true. But I wouldn't bet money on it, really. So before starting with the golden rules, let's see what will be your common bottlenecks on application. So that's based on, exp on our experience, on the emails that we receive asking for help. So basically CPU usage, like some calculations done on floating point on a mobile phone that doesn't have a floating point unit. Uh, you know, well, Android is based on Java, so <laughs> we are n let's not go into efficiency here. I mean, it's running a virtual machine. It has some cost. Then there is the bandwidth usage. Uh, the bandwidth can heavily hit our architecture as well, especially with the golden rules I will introduce you later that you can just be really like updating plenty of data. So CPU GPU synchronization, this means that when the CPU access some GPU data, some render target or something that it's being used by the GPU, since our GPU is deferred, that we are three frames, so the GL calls are three frames in advance of what the GPU is doing, then you have to ghost, which means copy data. That doesn't happen on NVIDIA, for example. So I'm it's likely that the uh, legacy applications that come from desktop work much better on an, on an NVIDIA car, especially if you deal with glibs and text and something like that, that you normally use the texture as a cache and keep updating it. We'll go back to it later. The, the other way, the other bottleneck is the fragment shader operations, because there are more fragment shaders than anything else on the game. Normally it's all lightning, blending, all the effects are done on a fragment shader, basically. The rest, I mean, the rest are very marginal, so it no, doesn't happen the, the usual. So, oh, I put this slide here. That's, I mean, these rules are obvious. It's like, welcome back to first year, top, year of uni. Some of these may seem obvious, some of those doesn't. But yeah, I mean, understand your target device. But that's a bit tricky one. So we don't name it here because I think we don't name any device, but I mean, that marketing doesn't do it doesn't mean that I cannot do it. So uh, not all the phones are the same, even though they may have the same name. For example, Galaxy S2 has a Mali device, a Tegra device, and a Power VR device. And <laughs> I mean, it's seriously, it's crazy. It's, Galaxy S4 has the Power VR device and an Ardeno device. And same goes with plenty of other devices that have two versions. So. Sometimes it's good to query the GL rendering string to be able to know which GPU vendor you are on, especially for some optimizations that may completely not work in some architectures and really work well in others. So golden rule number two. This one is an easy one. Don't waste GPU time. I mean, it's a mobile phone. You are not playing on a projector, not for now. So you can see the three ships are quite well looking, three of them. So well, it's what it says on the slide. Don't waste GPU time. This one is a bit more tricky. Promoting calculations up the chain, and especially you would see this if you try to hack some GP GPU using OpenGL ES2 shaders. So, I mean, as less you do a, an operation, as more optimal will it be, and that's clear. So, if you have to calculate the refraction index, you can put a, for example, instead of calculating the Fresnel, you can just put 05, and kind of will look nice. The reflection refraction index, so right. You can do the calculation, and there is other ways. It's like you can pre-bake it. So you can put the numbers on a texture and send that texture. And then from the fragment shader, where you read the texture, instead of reading RGB, you would be reading the result of an operation. So you would not have to do the maths in there. Just read from a texture that you would have on the cache. And well, normally, Fragment shaders are run more times than vertex shaders, and which are run more times than a, G, than a CPU render pass. And 
which are, is run more times than pre-baked calculation that you can pre-bake like 100 frames in a single movement. Anyway, good enough is a good, uh, good thing to remember here. So sometimes we would do lightning equations that would not make a real difference. So uh, this one is the important one. Don't access an active render target. So we work three frames in advance on OpenGL. This is just applies to tilers. So if you access a render target that is being used at that time, we will ghost. And ghosting is bad, it's very bad. It means that since the, the texture is being used, we cannot write into it. So the driver says, oh, but they are writing into it, so let's copy it. The driver makes a copy. And suddenly you ha you're like, you're using a huge amount of memory. And this happens especially with uh, navigation apps when a company from Germany decides to open market in China and goes like, okay, let's cache the text in the big textures we do here. <laughs> well, Chinese has much more characters, so you would have to update that texture and use it as a cache, and suddenly you would have a 4K by 4K texture that is being replicated 16 times in your memory, and that's bad. So what we recommend is to, first, don't, don't use a 4K by 4K texture. I mean, if you are just updating small parts of it, but we usually just have a circular buffer of textures that we upload. So you may have a, a circular buffer of three textures, then each frame update one, so there would be no collision and everything would run smooth as butter. Or how did some Chinese companies say it? Smo smooth, um, smooth as cheese. Still don't understand it. So don't access render targets. And that means that that's as well a vertex buffer. So if you have, this, yeah? Well, if you have to do some um, some advanced techniques, what you can do is use texture streaming, which is uh, in Android, for example, is implemented using EGL image external. But that's probably not the best way to go. Even though um, I don't really know how big engines solve blurring nowadays, but I think you can apply the effect on uh, the pixel backend buffer, which is our hardware. So I think it's done on chip per tile, but I'm totally not sure about it, and I think it's a very good question. I've never seen blurring on applied to any phone application. Have you, ever? Well, all these, uh, I mean, some of these effects are done by the, by the, chip, by the chip itself. Um, which, one is, which one you said, ambient occlusion? I'm not sure about it either. I uh, think we have a demo that shows how to do it, and I think it's doing a circular buffer of textures, but um, I'm not sure. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, just contact me afterwards, and I can send you the the actual answer to this. I mean, some of the effects I've never came across them because nobody uses them on mobile space. But truth this is that what will be mobile? I mean, desktop is becoming mobile, and mobile is becoming desktop. So a good example here can be the cloth simulation as well. So if you have a cloth simu cloth simulation that it's and you're accessing always the same vertex buffer. Not, let's just not speak about textures, but something different. You're accessing the same vertex buffer and changing the vertex position to simulate that cloth that may be ghosting that vertex buffer plenty of times. And you don't want that, really. Because maybe the case that the driver, instead of ghosting for memory restriction, decides to stall the pipeline. So then you would be running a painful FPS, which you definitely don't want that. Well, this is kind of uh, speaking about texture streaming and how to use some synchronization. So there is, a, there is some extensions that allows you to know when a texture is not being used anymore by the GPU and it's good to, to update. So that's, and then, there is the, um, and then there is the texture streaming, which is basically getting a texture that is a CPU pointer. And so the CPU can access it and the GPU can render it. You can think of it, uh, most vendors use it to stream video or camera. So you, can, you get the camera and you have your game and what's rendered on the camera appears on the game as a texture that's done by texture streaming, which is 
the GPU just renders what's in there and doesn't care if it's synchronized or not. Just renders a CPU address and that's about it. This is kind of the same again. So the void updating up the active assets or ghosting will appear. You don't want ghosting. This is what I told you about the three frames and the life pattern of an asset because since we go three frames in advance, it's very likely that we are ghosting if we are heavily updating assets. Which I mean is not that normal and it can be easily optimized, but may happen when you less expect it, like when you move your navigation application to China. Uh, using vertex buffer objects and, indent and index geometry, that's, I mean, that's kind of a regular one. I mean, if you don't need to send the vertices every frame to the ev or at every GL call, you can create a vertex object and just store it on the GPU. It's not likely that you are going to <laughs> change your character every time. I mean, your character would be looking in a single way, and unless you change the armor, then it may look different, but it doesn't need to be sent every time to the GPU. Yeah? You want to do? Scalar animation? Ah, okay. Well, but still the vertex would be the same, wouldn't it? Yeah, I guess. I, I mean, I always thought that vertex data remains constant unless you heavily change it with, you know, kind of morphing the character or... I mean, if you have a mesh, should be, should, yeah, exactly, should be always. I mean, if you morph, yeah, sure. I mean, the same name says it. And um, using index buffers and vertex buffers as well has a, an added advantage here, and is that our driver, I mean, we have a bunch of driver guys and they are paid to optimize, so they optimize vertex and index buffers in order that the GPU can get them faster. So. They store the position first, so then the GPU and the HSR step can get that data first and process it fast. And as far as I know, our driver internally just uses index buffer. So if you don't, our driver will create it, but please do it. So the less things you let the driver do, the better. Golden rule number seven. I mean, this golden rule is a bit confusing how it's set here, but it's basically change the render state as less times as possible. Every time that you, do, that, you, that you do a GL call, you're changing the render state. You don't want to change it. I mean, change it as less as possible. The less GL calls, the better. Sounds kind of redundant, but it's not. So batch the draw calls. If, if you're updating a texture 100 times on a frame, but you just do a draw call, it will get optimized by the driver because we are deferred renderers. So we will get all the GL commands, all the texture updates, we would get a staging buffer, and so we'll get just updated once. If you put plenty of drawing calls, may not get optimized, even though there is an, even though there is no EGL swap buffer in between. So the less render state changes, the better, and that's for that's for all the architectures as well. Golden rule number eight: compress your textures. That's a cool one. I mean. You can use either 2 bits per pixel or 32 bits per pixel. What do you think is better? Okay. Uh, you, may, you may argue that 2 bits per pixel is the quality is not the same. I, I totally agree. I think that this image yeah, kind of shows that the quality is really close to it. I mean, you can look at Epic Citadel or Rage on iOS. All of them are 2 bits per pixel. And I mean, this is our technology. It's been there for ages. And now ARM will come up with the... ASTC, which I think it's quite good as well. So, it, but they still, I think that there is still no uh, other device that is capable of two bits per pixel as of right now. So, compressed textures, and by compressing, we don't mean um, disk space; we mean memory, because PNG and JPG get decompressed in memory with the full size of the texture. You can do both, so you can compress with PBRTC and then zip them, so it will get less disk and less, less memory space. But I mean, if sometimes it's not worth to compress textures, but just when you compress them on device. So what big games do is have all the assets, and when you launch your game, downloads all the assets for your device from the Play Store, and that's all right. That's with all the textures already compressed. And golden rule number nine, never use alpha test or discard, or use alpha blend. So 
This applies to all the architectures. Using alpha test is completely breaking the pipeline. And let me show you why. Let's go back. Oh, it's a bit painful to go back all that. So what happens? Well, no, even uh, this one is better. So what happens if you run a fragment shader in the alo part, and there is an alpha test and tells you, oh, no, this object, that was not there. So the objects that were behind it are visible now. Well, it happens that you have to go on the beginning of the pipeline again for that object and the ones that were before. So that's like breaking the pipeline pretty bad. You don't want to do it. Uh, it's arguable that the quality would be the same. I, oops, sorry. I actually think it will be almost the same. Again, Epic Citadel. Epic Citadel is done with just alpha blending. And unless you spend all the entire demo staring at the trees, you won't notice a difference. Just don't stare at the trees that often. <laughs> I mean, trees are nice, but I mean, it's worth. And again, there is the reminder of OPAC, alpha test, alpha plan. I mean, if you have to use alpha test, use it after OPAC. So then the pipeline won't be hurt that much. Still would be hurt, and there are some optimizations, but please don't do it. Just think, think twice before doing it. And rule number 10, that's uh, that rule number 10. I mean, you program for all the devices, so. Calling clear not just ensures that the previous render isn't uploaded to the GPU. It ensures as well that it won't work fine on a Tegra device because it will flash the memory and have to reload it again. So um, if you develop for Tegra, you don't call clear. And likely, if you call clear, the driver will ignore it. Same way we will ignore some other calls. I mean, it's so take it. I mean, obviously, I'm here to, to help you optimizing for Power VR. So yeah, sure, call clear. But um, it's a bit, you probably don't want to lose the huge amount of performance on any other platform, thanks to me. Otherwise, I just receive, I don't know. I just don't want to know. Um, same goes for discard uh, frame buffer. We don't need that. We, I mean, the, our frame buffer is kept on hardware. So we don't need to keep a copy of it in software. Uh, some of the hardware vendors we have, since we give the driver as a reference, and they just get it and do whatever they want, and some of them disable calls, which fair enough, or force you to do calls. So they put a clear and a discard frame buffer, and that's about it. But so just be aware that these calls exist and they have some importance on the hardware you're running, especially. Just remember, clear on Tegra is really, really expensive, so. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's on a Power VR slide. Doesn't mean that you have to <laughs> always do it. But don't tell to marketing. I told you that, though. Don't send me an email about it and CC the whole office. <laughs>